Well, what happens is finally you enter the, for, the, the, the fourth turning and with this lack of direction, lack of regulation, lack of cohesion, everything runs aground eventually, right? You become very vulnerable to crisis. Um, and everyone has forgotten the habits of what you do to actually counter a crisis. So this is the whole problem every time you go into a fourth turning is that every generation at that time, by the time you're entering a new fourth turning, every generation who has had any adult experience handling a crisis is too old to serve. Welcome to Wealthion. I'm Wealthion founder, Adam Taggart. If you're not familiar with the term fourth turning, you need to patch that educational deficiency ASAP. Famed demographer Neil Howe coined that term years ago to describe the tumult and unwinding that occurs at major turning points in society when the status quo starts failing, ultimately to be replaced by a new order. Think the American Revolution, the Civil War, and World War II. Howe has long predicted that America and the West would enter such a fourth turning early in the new millennium, and the upheaval of the past several years certainly appears to be lending credence to that. From the global financial crisis, to the supply shocks of the COVID pandemic, to the geopolitical rifts caused by the war in the Ukraine. And Neil's now coming out with a new book shortly, building off of his earlier fourth turning work, and he'll return on this channel for an interview once it's been published early in 2023. So I'm replaying my earlier discussion with him here to make sure we're all up to speed when Neil returns early next year. Enjoy. Welcome to Wealthion. I'm Adam Taggart, founder of Wealthion, welcoming you back for another week of making sense of money and the markets so that you can make better informed decisions about building your wealth. Now, they say that history rhymes, that civilizations and societies, they tend to follow cycles, boom, bust, feast, famine, war, peace, cultural experimentation, a retrenchment back to the old ways of doing things. Today's guest expert is the author of the best-selling book, The Fourth Turning, which lays out his prediction that today's society has entered the bust part of our current cycle. That's where the status quo falls apart, often chaotically, to be replaced by a new, hopefully better order. What should we expect from this period of disruption? And are there steps we can be taking today to improve our odds for persevering? I'm very pleased to welcome researcher Neil Howe to the program today. He is one of the most requested experts that Wealthion's audience has been asking me to bring on the channel to date. Neil, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, wonderful to be here with you, Adam. Well, Neil, for viewers who are unfamiliar with your work, can, can we just start with a quick summary of your generational theory um, and its archetypes and turnings? Um, can you just offer us a quick synopsis of exactly what it is? Well, it, it's uh, work that I've been doing now for you know well on 20 years, uh, really dating back to the mid-1980s. Uh, and it started really, it's more than one book. Uh, we did, uh, uh, Bill Strauss and I, who passed away about 10 years ago, we, the two of us worked together on it for many years. We, we did a book in uh, 1991 called Generations, uh, The History of America's Future. It was really a generational biography of America, looking at all of American history as a sequence of collective generational biographies. And uh, it's, it's kind of, it's a great history read, uh, but it also shows that implicit in the generational story is a certain cyclicality. And that actually was a surprise to us. It's sort of uh, 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 serendipitous, you might say, uh, but it was something we, we, we certainly highlighted in the book. And we talked about these, uh, these cycles and, and basically uh, uh, it, this is something we did uh, later on in the early nineties, we wrote a book about Generation X. Uh, and then uh, uh, shortly after Doug Kuplin published uh, uh, Gen X, you know, remember the Generation X, the novel. And then in 1997, we did a book called The Fourth Turning, which was really uh, looking at the cyclicality of American history, not focusing primarily on generations, but focusing on the cycle itself and looking at generations, generational change as drivers. And then later on, we, we published a book uh, in 2000 called Millennials Rising. Uh, one of the features of our original book was the millennial generation, which is a label I guess you're all familiar with now. 
Uh, but we've been credited for uh, for better or for worse for for naming a bunch of generations, uh, which are you know whose 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 names are now in common parlance, like the GIs and the silent. Uh, at least either naming them or bringing a label to greater popularity. Um, so I've been heavily involved in thinking about generational change, uh, not only in America, but around the world. And I, I should point out that that's something we, uh, I, I will be spending more attention to in the future is not just looking at how this works out in America, but how does it work out globally, right? And that's something we might wanna talk about a little bit on the, on the show. Um, but in general, uh, the, the, the thesis is, is that it really starts from a remarkable, uh, many would say a coincidence in American history, which is that we have these periods of uh, vast civic uh, crises and recoveries, right? Uh, uh, at, 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 at intervals of roughly a long human lifetime, right? So if you go back and look during the American colonial era, we had what was known as the, uh, the glorious revolution in Britain. And it was an enormous period of, of uh, upheaval. Uh, the American colonies actually uh, uh, participated in that revolution, which is sort of the birth of parliamentary democracy in Britain. It was also the birth of a new colonial system in America right around the 1690s or early 1700s. And then of course we have the American revolution which was about you know, 80, 90 years later. And then we had the American Civil War, right? Another long human life. And then we had World War II and the New Deal, right? Another long human life, right? Another 80 to 90 years. And, um, and guess what, Adam? There we are today again, right? <laughs> We're at that interval, right? We also noticed that roughly halfway in between these great civic upheavals, which, which occur in our outer world, right, in, in the world of, of politics, the economy, infrastructure, um, you know, the, the big public world. Uh, we have these intervals roughly halfway in between of what we call the great awakenings of American history. These are the, these are the cultural revolutions, you might say. And we actually name them in American history. We talk about the first great awakening, the second great awakening, the third great, and many, many uh, social historians call the the consciousness revolution of the late 60s and the 70s, America's you know, fourth or fifth great awakening, depending on when you want you to uh, start to count. And all of these, this rhythm, right, uh, is associated with the coming of age of a different kind of generation, right? And, and we call them, we give them archetypal names. So you think about, um, first of all, the rhythm of, of these eras themselves. We call each era, which, lasts about a length of a generation, we call that turning. Okay, so that gives the, the title of the book, you know, the fourth turning. So each one of these long human lifetime spans can be divided into about, you know, 20 to 25 year periods. About the length of what we colloquially call a generation. You, know, you think about, you know, once in a generation, you're thinking about a length of time about that long. And, uh, and there are four different Turnings, right? There is the turning of the of the post crisis era. This is uh, we call that the first turning, uh, and and we also call it a high, like the American high. You remember after World War II, this would be the presidencies of of Truman and Eisenhower and John Kennedy, a period of great collective confidence, um, uh, not much individuality, not much a lot of cultural creativity, but America felt like it was more than the sum of its parts. Uh, social disorder was certainly at a very low ebb during that time in general. I mean, record low, you know, crime rates, for example, murder rates. You know, we had, we had uh, a lot of uh, social discipline uh, and, and a great sense of collective cohesion. Um, then, of course, we, that was followed by the second turning, and this always happens the same way in every cycle, right? The second turning was the consciousness revolution. Anyone who remembers the late 60s and 70s. A lot of Xers out there in the audience remember that as kids. <laughs> so they remember that as family breakup and you know Judy Bloom books and you <laughs> just all the all the chaos and dysfunction of that era. And that was typical. That's typical of an awakening era. Uh, this is a time of, of rampant idealism, reform, utopianism, self-discovery, the whole emphasis now on self, right? And a certain indivi new individualism breaks out, a new kind of fragmenting of the old social consensus. Um, 
And uh, in, in the 60s, it started out really as more of a cultural revolution on college campuses, but it ended up really as more of an economic revolution. You think of the tax revolt and deregulation, right? As you moved into the Reagan's morning in America, we were a newly individualized society. We become more lightly governed. We were comfortable, right? In a, in a, in a less, um, a less regimented order, you know, let everyone just be free to do whatever they want. Different strokes for different folks, right? I mean, and then of course you had a new generation coming of age. The generation that came of age during the awakening was boomers. And we call that the profit archetype, right? Uh, and they have a distinctive life cycle. The generation coming of age in this post-awakening era is uh, Generation X, right? Uh, so they, they, they saw the awakening as kids and they were young adults during the, during the third turning, right? And that's the, that's the turning that comes after, we call that an unraveling. And most recently that would have been the period really starting from the early eighties to the late 2000s. So we dated kind of 1984, morning in America with Reagan to the GFC, right? The, the 2008, 2009 crash, which really brought an end, you know, to the, um, to the, uh, 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 you know, the movable feasts and all the celebrity, you know, uh, uh, culture and celebration. And uh, um, and that was a period in which public history, nothing seemed to change, right? I mean, nothing really happened publicly. I mean, aside from the very beginning, it really didn't happen in America, the, the, the fall of the Soviet Union, right? Um, and we had 9-11, which turned out to not have a hugely permanent imprint um, uh, and, and of course now we're in this new era. So that was, that was a Gen X coming of age. We call that the nomad archetype. They're very similar by the way. And every, we have lots of examples of the nomad archetype in American history. These tend to be kids who are left alone is right. And they become very resourceful and pragmatic and resilient. Uh, and they, they manage well as individuals. They're very good at handling risk. Um, uh, and then, of course, you have the generation coming after Xers. That's the new millennial generation. And they're coming of age really in this new era, right? Uh, and they got hit early on. The first wave got hit early on by the GFC, right? It's just as they were coming out of high school and so on, just as they were getting their first uh, coming out of college. And the later part of that generation has been hit by the, by the pandemic, right? So that's kind of the you know, early end bash, you know, hammering that this generation has taken early on. And we notice very different traits about millennials, right? This new emphasis on community, on niceness, on risk aversion, closeness to family. Uh, interestingly, these are also traits we've seen in what we call the hero archetype in history, who eventually comes of age during the crisis. And as young adults plays a very important part in rebuilding right, the order before they have moved on to midlife, right? So, the, so the, this, this, this project starts before they enter, you know, their, before most of them enter their mid forties. So they are the ones who really participate collectively in sort of the establishment of the new order. And I think you can already see signs of that in, in the very new tribalism in America, right? Everyone is grouping around these enormous groups and the, the uh, political participation is hugely risen, right? Everyone knows that politics is really important now. I think that's a real difference between the 1990s, you know, the Clinton era and the GW Bush era, when everyone just tuned out on politics. You know, none of it matters. Uh, investors don't have to care about what Congress is doing or, or, or the president is doing. I'm telling you, Adam, now they got to care because <laughs> what's coming out of Washington, not just the Fed, I mean that you know the, the markets have always said you know you can't you know you, you know never fight the Fed right so, so that has always been taken for granted uh, but now it's Congress now it's going to be presidential elections now it's going to be fundamental issues of of power top down change that could come very quickly particularly as America increasingly feels that everything is out of control and we really need to move toward more radical solutions. I, I do find it very interesting that both parties are kind of drifting toward their, toward their populist fringes, right? You see the populists really running the show now. 
uh, in among the Democrats pushing through their enormous new, you know, super, you know, quote unquote infrastructure package, the social infrastructure package, as they call it. Um, uh, and then you see on the on the on the red zone, you know, populists also running the show. But you think about all the things they have in common, right? Uh, I think they're both pro-inflationary. I think they're both um, uh, uh, populist in the sense of wanting to upset the, you know, reorient the system away from the haves to the have-nots. That has really important implications, by the way, for what's now going on, right? In in the bond markets, you, you we can actually talk about that a little bit longer term as to how this fourth turning is going to play out. But you know, that's a that's a quick overview, and I, I will just say overall that there's a seasonality here. We talk about seasons of history, right? Well, literally, when you think about a long human lifetime as as being in four seasons, right? Uh, sort of spring, summer fall, winter, those are a little bit like the seasons of the saculum. And the saculum really is this 80 to 90 year span, uh, this lifetime span. Uh, the only thing that makes it really interesting is that everyone typically, if you live a long human life, you will experience all four seasons at some time in your life. But the difference is depending on your generational membership, you will see each season at a different age in your life, right? So some 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 generations get to see uh you know the 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 awakening uh as uh as young adults. Some get to see it as elders. Some get to see it as kids. Some get to see it as midlife. But we all get to see each period once. And that's what makes it fascinating because our interaction is very different depending on our age. Um well that's the word I was thinking during the whole time you were talking there, Neil, which is it's just fascinating. And uh, this is not the first time that, that you know, I, I've uh, been familiar with your work and having been exposed to it many years ago, it, it is such a really effective framework for understanding the world around you. You know, once you sort of understand the, the cyclicality that you're talking about and what to expect from each archetype and, and, and what to expect from each turning, it really does have huge explanatory factors for events that that might seem otherwise maybe not as interconnected as, as they probably truly are. So, uh, so many questions here, uh, both from me and from, from our audience. Um, but let's let's hang on to the seasonality aspect that you just talked about. So um, I think what you're saying is, is, hey, you know, we, we are entering winter, we're probably actually in, you know, the first you know, third of it or something like that at this point, if, yeah. if, if this current fourth turning started with a great a global financial crisis. Um, and I think most people, particularly those watching that maybe haven't been familiar with your work and are just sort of hearing this for the first time, are thinking, okay, how do I make it through the winter? <laughs> how bad is this winter going to be? How cold is it going to get? Uh, and how do I make sure that I come out of the other end of it alive? So you talk a little bit about this, but if you can quickly, just what do generally what defines a fourth turning like what what kind of progression should we be expecting here as we get deeper into it and, and then I'll, I'll ask this question after you answer that but but then specifically what are you expecting from this particular fourth turning so in general what a fourth turning you know you think about the supply and demand for social order that's one fundamental way of thinking about all of the turnings right so you come out of a crisis in the first turning, say the American high, say we're living in under, you know, a, a Truman or Eisenhower. Well, what's the lesson of the recent crisis, right? Uh, it is that, you know, America is fragile. Uh, you know, our place in the world is, and it is, is, is fragile and that we have to band together, right? Big, in, big institutions have to be powerful and there has to be a total consensus. And there is a lot of consensus demanded of people. But interestingly, during these areas, people are willing to give that consensus, right? In other words, that in other words, the 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 supply of, of order is very high, uh, and it's and it's and it's uh, and it's uh, uh, is very high. But the the demand for order is is very high as well, right? So we want a lot of order, and we get a lot of order. And uh, uh, what happens during an awakening is. All those institutions start out being as strong as ever, but suddenly 
the public no longer want demands order anymore, right? It wants freedom. It wants to be authentic again. A lot of this has to do with the generational turnover. You have a whole new generation of kids who remember nothing about the crisis, right? You have boomers. They have, by definition, they have no memory of World War II. So they're thinking, wait a second, you know, we need more freedom. We got to loosen this up. We need to start discovering us. So look at you guys, you know, you're, you're automatons. Yeah. Got to get the and, man out of my life. What? Got to get the man out of my life. Well, exactly. And, and you need to rediscover something much more authentic. So that became really the, the new orientation of the awakening. So the supply of order remained high, but the demand hugely fell, right? And that gave rise to the chaos of the 60s. You couldn't get a, a public consensus anymore behind any of these issues. Now, some of them we, we managed to accomplish, like sending a man to the moon almost in the same month as Woodstock, right? So we were doing some of this stuff on top of each other, right? We were both blowing up the system and actually showcasing some of the system's last and magnificent achievements at the same time. I mean, wasn't that amazing? By the way, on the same month, uh, you know, Ted Kennedy ran his car up Chappaquiddick, which actually illustrated yet another aspect of the awakening, yep. <laughs> the breakup of family life. So you see all of these ha things happening at the same time. But by the end of that era, um, uh, we were a newly liberated society in terms of- you had the, the me generation, greed exactly. is good, all yeah, that. And the, the new narcissism and you know all the stuff that uh, Tom Wolf would talk about in his novels and so forth. So, so finally then we entered the third turning. And the third turning is an is a era when both the supply of order is 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 uh, both the, the the supply of order is low, but the demand for order is also low. So there's a new kind of equilibrium. We become a lightly governed country, and we become very much likely were in the 1920s, or the 1850s, or the 1760s, um, a kind of a, a rowdy, rebellious, fragmented country. Uh, not much that unified us, but we're all kind of happy with it. You know, we're all sort of individually prospering. We feel good about ourselves. And all the, the new generation, the nomad archetype, uh, delights in becoming free agents. You know, my, my favorite uh, extra slogan is, uh, it works for me. <laughs> I, mean, I love that, you know. I don't care if it works for anyone else. It works for me. That's good enough. <laughs> so uh, now to older generations, that was always kind of a shocking motto. Well, you know, I mean, how selfish is that, right? So, but anyway, we were all comfortable with that. Uh, and you remember even Bill Clinton, uh, the head of the Democratic Party, the era of big government is over, right? So just a capitulation across the board. And we saw this, by the way, in Britain with Tony Blair. We, we saw that with this whole, you know, uh, kind of neoliberalism, as we can to call it. It's sort of the, the third way that all of these uh, social democratic parties were taking around the world, right? Acknowledging markets, right? Yeah, I guess it is okay. We just open everything up. You know, don't have to regulate anything anymore. Well, what happens is finally you enter the, for the, the, the fourth turning. And with this lack of direction, lack of regulation, lack of cohesion, everything runs aground eventually, right? You become very vulnerable to crisis. Um, and everyone has forgotten the habits of what you do to actually counter a crisis. So this is the whole problem every time you go into a fourth turning is that every generation at that time, by the time you're entering a new fourth turning, every generation who has had any adult experience handling a crisis is too old to serve or they've already passed away, right? So that's the problem, right? No one is left to handle it. The only person we have left, the very eldest of our leaders now, and they're still around, Nancy Pelosi and Joe Biden and, and uh, you know, uh, 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 gee, like Bernie Sanders, a bunch of them are kind of late wave silent, right? They actually remember World War II as kids. But these kids, as tiny kids, you know, maybe as babies, right? But the greatest generation is gone, right? I mean, it's now in its 90s. Uh, it's mostly gone. We only have a few million left. Uh, and uh, they are the last ones who actually have any really degree of competence. So we have to learn it all over again. <laughs> Isn't that the lesson of history? 
Yeah, so and, and, and Neil, I'm just curious, is, is it fair to say that, that at the end of a turn and going into the next one, you have um, a generation that's sort of in the prime of its life running the show that kind of has almost the exact wrong musculature that you need for what's demanded going forward, right? They, they've been training for a completely different race than, than what's going to be needed going forward. Well, it is true, except I would say it's, it's not quite that bad in the sense that you're talking about boomers. I guess, uh, you know, the, well, I think in any generation, you got, you got a, right now we got a bunch of, you know, kind of lone wolves out there you're talking about, but we're going to throw, right. go through a time that's going to need us to come together socially. Right? Well, that, that's true. But, but what happens is, is that it does happen, but it doesn't happen in a necessarily very pretty way or very easy way. But I think what does happen is that each generation, uh, ultimately when a crisis works out well, each generation in its phase of life actually uh, contribute something essential to the resolution of the fourth turning. And that is what, what the profit archetype contributes is that sense of vision, right? The big picture, right? Because, you know, the, the profit archetype has always been a big picture generation. So they're the ones thinking about, you know, in earlier centuries, they're thinking about the millennial era, the second coming, you know, they're phrasing it in these wonderful, huge ideas. And Boomers will be talking about, you know, in the, the, the new age of Aquarius. Or, I mean, you know, you only imagine how boomers would be. But anyway, boomers would, in the new fourth turn, we actually call this the role of the so-called gray champion. You know, it comes back again in history. The elder leader who reminds people of the larger picture, right? Generation X, who will be of the age of, um, of George Patton or Ulysses Grant or George Washington, they will be the midlife commanders, the leaders, right? They will be the ones who actually are most responsible for actually getting things done, right? They won't be the big picture generation. I mean, good, God knows, right? <laughs> Gen X or attitude toward that is, you know, yeah. die, yuppie scum, you know? So <laughs> Gen Xers will be getting stuff done and they're actually very well suited to that role. You know, just as, um, the lost generation turned out to be perfectly suited to the role of the midlife, uh, you know, two-star, three-star generals in World War II, right? The, the, the likes of Omar Bradley or, or Dwight Eisenhower or, or even George Patton, uh, talking about a, a real nomad, a kind of a, but, but these were guys who were get it done, you know, tough talking, no nonsense guys. The doers, right? yeah. The doers, uh, and uh, generally, tended to be taciturn or kind of laconic in their personality. They just, you know, focused on the bottom line, getting stuff done. And then the new generation coming of age needs to be a generation with a more open, cooperative, uh, community-minded ethos, right? Of one of being able to band together to whatever needs to be done and actually um, uh, participating in an enormous team and making sure that everyone's on board, right? Uh, exactly the opposite of boomers, right? I mean, boomers, you can never get, you know, the old expression herding cats, right? It was always true about boomers, even when they were young. And they were always defiant and they were always raging against authority. One thing that's amazing about millennials, they're never defiant. They never rage against authority. I mean, it's very hard to see it. I mean, they're living with their parents at an unprecedented rate. Uh, and they are generally very close to older generations on a personal level. Now, I think millennials do have a big agenda. They have some big differences with their parents about how the overall rewards of the system are being handed out, right? Uh, namely, that liberal democracy no longer works for them. I mean, Absolutely. it's all biased toward older people. Now it's all biased toward market incumbents. I mean, let's face it, right? It's all piled up toward the silent and the boomers today. And this generation, um, you know, Raj Chetty at Harvard has some wonderful slides on this. He just shows that by the time, and actually not just millennials, but even most Xers, most of them are not out earning their parents at age 30 or 40, right? And particularly males are actually under earning their parents by a significant extent at age 30 or 40. Well, that is a real crisis in America, right? We were founded on the premise of, um, of the American dream, which meant generational advancement. And older generations experience that, right? 
the GI generation experienced it hugely over their own parents. The, the silent generation experienced that most boomers, particularly the early wave of boomers, you know, the Al Gore, Bill Clinton <laughs> boomers kind of born toward the earlier end, did much better than their parents at age 30 or 40. But you start getting the late wave boomers, kind of more your, you know, Madonna, Michael Jackson cohorts born in the late, uh, late 50s and then going on into your Xers. They are not. Right. Uh, so that kind of generational progress has completely stalled. And I, I actually do believe this is an essential ingredient. Uh, ben Friedman wrote a classic book about this about 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, liberal democracy requires progress. It requires material progress. If you do not have that, then we start regressing into a reactionary social mode. Right. Everyone just wants to draw up the moats. Right and bring up the, the, the drawbridges and, and we become truly that incumbent economy we talked about. And everyone will like, you know, Warren Buffett will be talking about investing in something with big moats. <laughs> Just to make sure you have a position, which some monopoly market position, which can't be assailed. And that becomes a very uncompetitive, uninnovative society, right? And I think that's that is what we that's the nightmare fourth turning. That is the fourth turning with a bad outcome that we want to avoid. Uh, interesting. Well, let's dig into that because you're putting your finger on a wound that we actually talk about a lot on this program week after week, which is the growing and really accelerating wealth inequality, uh, certainly here in the U.S., but but also elsewhere in the world. Um, it, right now, I'll just be honest, it's sort of hard for me to see that resolving uh, well and, and without much conflict. Um, but you're the generational expert here. I mean, how, how worried are you in this fourth turning that it, it sort of turns the different archetypes against each other because, you know, the, the, the extras feel like they've just been seeing the brass ring move further and further away from them as, as, as they've aged. And the millennials and youngers are saying, I, I, it's not even realistic for me to be able to grab that thing. And those boomers and silent generations, they're just, just holding onto it with, you know, tight, tight claws. Yeah, I think, I think the, you know, we, we see almost no instances historically where you actually have an age war, you know, I mean, that just doesn't happen. Um, and one thing that would argue against it is the fact that, as I, argue, as I mentioned earlier, when it comes to actually their personal lives and the culture, uh, I would argue that millennials are much closer to their boomer parents than boomers were as young adults to their own parents, right? Uh, boomers were extraordinarily distant from their own parents. And uh, none of them lived at home once they left home. <laughs> I mean, it was, and when they were dropped off at college, it's like, yeah, I'll call you in six months, you know, or something like that at a, at a pay phone down at the corner or something. Uh, millennials are on their texting and they're calling their, their parents uh, every day, practically. I mean, it's a completely different relationship. A record share of young people are living with their parents, right? So that on a personal level, their lives are highly intertwined and, um, and, 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 and kind of mutually dependent. Um, where, 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 although boomers had huge personal problems with their GI generation parents, particularly on cultural issues, you know, like what can you, what can I do in terms of, I don't know, sex, drugs, and rock and roll, and, you know, just everything else, right? You just don't get it, mom. I don't know if you any, you know, readers are old enough to recall all in the family, right? Uh, oh, I'm and, sure we have viewers who remember our children. <laughs> the sitcom, but it's literally people, the entire episode, young people and Archie Bunker and Edith screaming at each other. The entire show is just screaming, right? You don't see that today, right? You see things like that, even weird shows like Modern Family and I mean, just all kinds of shows. But generally you see much more cohesion, uh, a much different tenor now being showed. Now, here's where though it inverts, Adam, and that is that even though Millennials got along personally very low well with their parents and, and boomers did not. I mean, actually a good example of that would be boomeranging back home. Boomers did not boomerang, okay? And I remember uh, the, the great recession of, of uh, 82, 83, you know, when you went into the Reagan administration, Volcker was tightening rates and so on. It was a really pretty bad recession. 
boomers would do anything rather than return. They would like sleep under a bridge or something, right? But they would not go back home, right? That boomerang stuff started with Gen Xers in the 90s. And with millennials, they don't return home. They just never leave. <laughs> they just keep their bedroom there. And, you know, they're always coming. And you understand what I mean? Just a very different kind of relationship. Yeah, yeah. Uh, where I think there's an, a little bit of inversion is when it came to actually major structural substantive reforms and how the system worked and how it actually you know, allocated income and rewards and how we actually built for our future. Boomers had no problem with the GIs were doing. I mean, they obviously ran things really well. In fact, the whole problem with the GI generation is they ran things too well. They invested too much, right? It's too much repression. You know, we need to enjoy ourselves more for today. The millennial problem with boomers is just the opposite, right? Boomers can't run anything. They can't exercise authority. They can't invest in anything. They can't do anything for the long term, right? They don't know how to run the system at all. And this is why I say that the fundamental problem in an awakening is that the public senses that institutions are supplying too much order. But the fundamental problem of a crisis, the fourth turning, is that the public, be, particularly the younger public, begins to sense that institutions aren't supplying enough order. And that is always the context for a crisis, right? And by the way, I mean, just, just mentioning, you know, you said, where might this lead? Every fourth turning in American history has featured a total war. Um, and all total wars in American history have come in a fourth turn, right? You want to think about that. You know, and this goes all the way back to the Anglo-American seculum, you know, going back in the early modern era, you know, into British history. But this is a pattern. Now, sometimes it's, um, it's so it is, we don't say that war is necessary for a fourth turning, but that sense of total public urgency and the need to band together and create a new sense of community is always required at some point before the fourth turning is over, okay? So this is something that's just simply, I just observe historically. Now, sometimes this struggle, this conflict, is we think of it mostly in terms of, you know, America taking on enemies abroad, right? And I think that's the, the idea of the good war. And we, we all think of World War II, you know, we took on the Axis powers and we conquered half the world, right? Uh, you know, fighting Black fascism out. and yeah. Exactly, uh, you know, Germany and Italy and Japan. Uh, but we forget that that era started out with the New Deal, which was not exactly a civil war, but it was a highly contentious ideological conflict in America, right? Which deeply divided Americans about the new role of government and. You know, it had its court packing threats and, you know, everything else that happened uh, in the first New Deal and the second New Deal and, and, and FDR finally getting this incredible victory in 1936, right? Finally just becoming absolutely dominant politically and pushing through these new, this whole new role for government and the economy, right? Um, but ultimately, we all remember how it all came together in World War II, which is more kind of, you know, America versus the world. But it's useful to go back in earlier conflicts, and many of these actually had a very major a civil dimension of conflict. Obviously, a civil war was literally <laughs> a civil war, right? No need to explain there. The American Revolution, however, is interesting for people to know that the American Revolution at the time was referred to by most more Americans as a civil conflict, as a civil war, rather than as a revolution. It had a very strong element of Patriot on Tory conflict within the United States, particularly within the Southern states. The backwoods regulators actually supported the British because they hated these big plantation owners near the coast who were always lording it over them, right? And in other words, it exploited, and the British at one point did what Abraham Lincoln did. He promised freedom to the blacks. And then one of the things the British couldn't understand is why all these planters were you know, constantly talking about liberty. <laughs> You know, and and yet they had all these slaves. So the British said, "Well, we're going to use that as a weapon. We're going to we're going to promise freedom to anyone who wants to help." It's exactly what Abraham Lincoln did, right, with his Emancipation Proclamation about 80, 90 years later. Um, in ditto, as you go back in earlier crises. In other words, very often there's a very strong internal component to the crisis, even while it also has an. Ex I mean, obviously, there's an external component to the American Revolution. We had to fight. 
you know, fight the British and, uh, you know, defeat them finally at, at Yorktown. And, and, you know, they all evacuated by uh, 1783 and they were gone. Uh, but then again, we, we were in chaos after that, right? And then we had to actually forge a new constitution. And, and in some ways, that was the real climax of the era is being able to actually then agree on a powerful central government. And to some extent, I would say that there was the miracle of, of 1788, which is even more amazing than the miracle of, uh, you know, 1781, which is the, the defeating of, uh, of uh, you know, Clinton and Cornwallis. So, so anyway, that's, I, I think that but it probably illustrates your point that there is an important internal dimension. I think it's no, be no surprise today, looking at America, that people are gonna say, yeah, I get the internal component right now, right? Red zone versus blue zone. I mean, my God, the two sides don't even talk to each other. You know, I, I live in DC. I mean, I've been sort of a DC guy. Uh, they don't even talk to each other now. I mean, there's literally practically no communication. What, there's nothing to say at this point, Adam, <laughs> you know, right? So when you have mutually exclusive ideas of what the country's future is, how does democracy work, right? Are you going to completely forfeit your future just because the other guy gets, I don't know, half a percent more votes? No, it doesn't work that way, does it? And here's the irony, and this has been pointed out by some, you know, brilliant, uh, uh, Carl Becker pointed that out in 1940, just as we were going into World War II. He said, one of the problems with democracy is democracy only works really well when the problems you're trying to solve are pretty trivial. <laughs> I mean, think about it. If it's a fundamental problem, how does democracy work? Right. And, and I think COVID may have even sort of reinforced that argument where you looked at some of the more totalitarian governments and we can say whether it's right or wrong. Uh, but they certainly took measures to clamp down uh, and, and really stop the virus spread in its tracks in a way that a democracy just couldn't. I, I agree. And there's a there's a great, uh, a wonderful compendium of uh, worldwide polls done, run by the Cambridge Institute for, for uh, a Democracy uh, by a guy named Roberto Foa. And he and Yasha Monk have written a lot on this issue of growing inequality, but particularly in the turning away of younger generations in America, uh, particularly millennials, um, not just in America, but around the world from the whole idea of liberal democracy. It's, it's becoming less popular, less interesting and important. Uh, amazingly enough, there are a lot more younger people today who are willing to say, yeah, let a dictator you know, handle things for a while, right? Uh, meaning that this liberal democracy that all these boomers and silent talk about has done nothing for us. It just feathers the bed of all these older people and all these, in, you know, uh, uh, dysfunctional institutions, which aren't doing anything for our future, right? And, right. and that sense of that sense of being turned off uh, and being much more willing and open to a more autocratic, it doesn't really matter too much whether it's on the left or the right. You understand what I mean? Or it could be some crossbreed between them. Well, in, in you know, in some ways, um, you know, can you blame the younger generation um, in the sense that it, it's seeing all the spoils go to the older generations, as we've talked about? Um, and, you know, you get somebody that's promising them free education, free health care, whatever, you know, the, the, the platforms of those more progressive, uh, you know, uh, political parties sound pretty appealing, right? Hey, look, if I'm, if I'm going to struggle, I may as well, you know, struggle and get something. So you said, you know, part of the fourth turning is, is basically seeing the rise of a, a recentralization of power, uh, and I think that that's probably one of the drivers that will will drive you know the, the um, exactly. resumption of, of central state power. And, and here in the states, I mean, we're we're seeing the state get involved in in ways that it hasn't in a long time. Right. No, you're at, well. I mean, think about it. For for uh, most of the year in 2020, uh, the state took over everything. I mean, we all became wards of the state, right? businesses, households, everyone. I mean, nothing remotely close to that has happened in American history. Now that example won't go away quickly. You know what I mean? People will remember that. Yeah, that you can do that, right? Everyone that was dependent on the state, even major corporations, you know, to, to renew their, turn over their loans. I mean, everything, right? The combination of, 
huge fiscal largesse plus the Fed policy, right? Yeah, the, the stimulus has been, I mean, unprecedented. Yeah, and and it and it. By the way, it rewrites the rules of the regime. Um, and you know, I pointed that out. I mean, if you look at the six quarters of the pandemic. Uh, and compare them to the quarter before the pandemic, you know, the last quarter of 2019, we've had something like a 7% growth in real disposable personal income. At the same time, we've had a 2% decline or nearly 3% decline actually in real GDP. That is unprecedented, right? A 10 percentage point gap between what we're earning to be able to spend and what our economy is producing. I've gone back and looked at all the earlier recessions, that gap is never more than like one and a half percent. So where did all that free money come from? It came from borrowing. <laughs> it came from borrowing. And it came from, first of all, borrowing by the federal government, which we've seen it ramp that we went into the recession, by the way, already under Trump at a uh, federal deficit of nearly 5% of GDP. That was already a, a, a record for a non-recession year. Before the pandemic, we right. were 4.8% of GDP. Um, and you know everyone was fine with that. Uh, 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 Jerome Powell was fine with that. You know Donald Trump was obviously fine with that. And then the next two years are at 12.5% of GDP, right? So that was an extra five and a half percent of GDP kicker in two years. Well, that translates into about 10% of, of DPI, right? Disposable personal income. So that's how you get there, right? This changes the rules of the regime. And the reason why so many people have been faked out in the market. And uh, I mean, if you had told, if you had told people back in the worst days of March, back in 2020, that we were going to uh, you know, the S&P 500 was going to double again <laughs> in three. Yeah, well, I think if you told them first, the global economy is, you know, going to shrink in, in the next well, yeah, you know, but 10 it, months. It, what do you think is going to happen to the S&P? Nobody would guess it would double. <laughs> well, exactly. That it was going to double. And oh, by the way, and they would have already disbelieved you. But if you told them that in addition to doubling, uh, the uh, employment level in America would still be would still be lingering about 5% below where it was at the beginning, and that we'd be having close to 2,000 deaths per day after 18 months, and yet we'd see the S&P death, they would have thrown you out of the room, right? And, and meanwhile, we've had the, the 40th anniversary of the, of the you know, bond uh, bull market, right? We, we, we saw September 30th, 1980, we had uh, bonds, 10-year yield at 15.8 something, I think 15.84. What's going on with that at a time now when the economy is recovering, the, the, the S&P 500 doubled? I mean, how do you see bonds so low? Well, it turns out now they're not quite so low. <laughs> maybe, they're, maybe they're shifting in a slightly different direction now. But here's the point. Why do the old rules don't work? Why do the, all, those, all those valuation rules you know, that we talk about, like, like you know, Schiller's PE, you know, um, uh, you know, earnings to sales ratios or, or um, right. They just the haven't mattered indicator. for the past half decade. Right. Yeah. So they've all, you know, they're, they're off the charts. They've all been screaming sell, but if you had sold recently, you would have been killed. Right. So I, this is a really important question for investors. Why are all these rules not working? And I would submit that we're changing regimes now. We're going from an old regime, which we, we call the, you know, sort of the neoliberal regime, the Fed just you know, buys and sells at the short end, influence interest rates over the business cycle. And, they, and the federal government keeps the budget reasonably balanced because they can't expect the Fed to bail it out, right? And, and you know, a little bit maybe uh, in a crisis, the Fed will offer credit at penalty rates, kind of the old budget rule. In the new regime, which you could call the MMT regime, right? <laughs> well, what, yeah. what, what, what is it now? The Fed can buy any asset at any maturity. It can flatten the entire year curve down. It can also go after high risk credit. It can do anything it wants. And the federal government can basically cut taxes or expand benefits any way it wants to. And the Fed will just monetize, right, monetize the difference, right? Yeah. So, hey, you know, sorry to interrupt, but this is such an important 
um, question that so many of the viewers have been asking themselves of late, which is, um, are we going to see in this fourth turning kind of, will reality re-express itself? And, and it certainly may amongst things like, you know, physical resource limitations and stuff like that, because you can't necessarily print those up overnight. Um, but well, sort of economically here, will, will reality re-express itself and all those old fundamentals of investing and whatnot begin to matter again? Yes. Or have we crossed a Rubicon where the Fed is just going to be intervening in any and all cases going forward? And it's not, we're not going to return to that because they require very different investing strategies. Right. Well, valuation, you know, ultimately always matters. <laughs> you can't banish the concept of valuation. But I would argue that it's now, because of the regime change, operating on a big delay and it's operating indirectly, right? We have a new regime it still has to operate. There will always be something called valuation, right? But it's gonna operate differently now. And I think what's happening is, is that uh, in response to this, we're seeing, I think what's clearly with this, you know, huge monetary stimulus, I mean, the, the combination of the fact of this enormous borrowing, which is gonna continue, right, through the, through the 2020s, um, and the Fed flattening of the yield curve, which is further inflating the demand for equities because it's just encouraging everyone to borrow. I mean, you see mergers and acquisitions going to record levels, buybacks now. We may be a record buyback in the third quarter. Uh, amazing. You know, everyone is because here's the new policy is it doesn't matter what you buy after having borrowed. That's a slam dunk. You can borrow anything now and invest the money in anything and you'll be a winner. I mean, right? I mean, we have now uh, long-term treasury yields, which are not only several percentage points below the CPI or the PCE, but 90 basis points below even what bondholders themselves expect long-term inflation to be. And, Isn't and that crazy? Back. Yeah, we've, so, we've, so got, we've got junk, junk bond yields below the CPI. It, exactly, exactly. You, you will, exactly. You know, high risk end. So what that means is that the only way this can be rectified ultimately going down the road, and it will, you know, it all depends on the speed at which this happens, depends a, bit, a little bit on Congress, but it will be inflation and inflation expectations. So I, I, I really do believe that this is how it's going to play out. Ultimately, of course, inflation, you have to you remember, particularly when inflation expectations begins to accelerate, puts an end to everything, right? The Fed has to change course. And even the MMT theorists agree. Yeah, once you get, you know, accelerating inflation, you have to stop the whole credit creation factory, right? So the Fed is going to have to start, you know, reversing quantitative easing to quantitative tightening. It's going to have to then start raising the front end. And then, of course, the back end will rise as, 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 as bond yields rise. But, but, but then what's going to happen is, that's going to not only will you have a higher discount rate which will pull down the valuations of equities, but also it will tend to deflate and make collapse all the debt pyramids, which underlie a lot of the investing in equities, right? So all those buybacks, all those borrow to invest schemes that everyone has, all that's going to be you know, going, right? Particularly at the high risk, end, starting at the high risk end, right? And then finally, and this is the killer. This is what I think people don't realize fiscal policy will be unable to neutralize. And I think that's what people don't understand. Now, you remember back in um, back the last time this happened with Volcker, right? Volcker suddenly said, we got to get rid of inflation. We're going to just stop the growth in the money supply. I'm going to let the, you know, well, he let it. That's when it reached its record, right? 15.8%. Right. That's because he wasn't going to accommodate this. And what was the only way to present a real disaster to the economy? Reagan ran huge deficits, right? You remember, that was the policy. Monetary tightening, fiscal easing. This is what scares me, Adam, is that in this coming era, once you get those expectations of yields going way up, particularly in the out years, Congress won't be able to do that. You know why? Because never before in history, have the uh, deficit projections depended so critically on low interest rate assumptions.
I, I go over every year, I go over the, the CBO's long-term budget projections, right? And they're, they're now projecting that nominal yields will be beneath nominal GDP growth all the way until 2038. <laughs> Think about that. So this is how they get to borrow all that amount during the 2020s, early 2030s, without the GDP, you know, debt to GDP ratio growing, because they just assume that we're going to have these extraordinarily low interest rates. Now, once that assumption changes, instead of rising from where it is now, you know, we're about what, 103, 104% of GDP in terms of publicly held federal debt. Instead of rising and make 150% or something that's already unsustainable, we'll be talking about 250, 300, 350 at that point. And by the way, at that point, we're going to have runs on the dollar. Right. So in other words, everyone who holds federal debts can be think, are we ever going to get this back? <laughs> right. So you imagine all the sovereign wealth funds and all the central banks abroad. So they'll be running. So at that point, the, the, the federal government's going to, have to say, no, we either have to raise taxes or cut benefits. This is not going to be any longer a game of, of handing out pleasures. It could be a game of allocating pain. That's, by the way, going to make the political struggle much more difficult. It's been very easy in the past two years to handle the blue and red conflict when all you're looking at is passing out different tax cuts or benefits, right, to groups. Wait until we have to do the reverse. All right. So this is the exact meat that I was hoping to get into with you here, Neil. And I hate the fact that we're coming up near the end of our time here. So we're going to have to have you back on at some point. Um, but uh let me let me let me repeat back a few things you said just so you can clarify them for viewers. Um, uh, you know, you you basically see uh, the, the Fed has changed its behavior. It's going to continue to try to you know this this monetary and fiscal largesse is going to continue uh, to the point where it begins to create so much inflation that inflation becomes too much of a problem, and we have to start tightening the system. And it's that tightening. Uh, along with some of the constraints you mentioned that we have on our massive debts and whatnot that are not going to allow uh, financial, uh, sorry, uh, fiscal stimulus to, to do what it did in, in uh, periods past, where we're going to have essentially kind of a, a perfect storm. Um, and that storm is going to, um, uh, it's going to bring prices down. Uh, it's going to probably force um, well, uh, benefit yeah. cuts. I, so, I, I, I guess this is the key question I'll let you go is, is all of this part of this current fourth turning that you're projecting? Well, first of all, I, I, I disagree a little bit with your description of the outcome. I actually, I think that even though we're going to have to tighten because we, we can't let inflation get out of control. I mean, obviously the Fed is going to have to be with, instead of underneath price expectations, it has to go above it, right? And that's going to be the big revolution, right? But nonetheless, I do think that the Fed is going to accommodate as much inflation as it can while just making sure it doesn't accelerate. And I'll tell you why they will do that. Because inflation will actually bring a solution to two, three big problems, right? First of all, it will help the economy run hot, right? And that's what the Fed wants. That's what everyone wants. We want unemployment to be down the lowest possible number. So we're going to let you know, wage and price inflations go on, maybe go gradually go up to two, four, three percent, four percent, five percent, even higher. And finally, maybe we'll put on price controls like we did during the Korean War, particularly World War II. Um, we'll also do it because it brings down the debt to GDP ratio. That's right, it the helps with the debt service. That's the way we've always done it in the past, right? Inflation is the miracle worker. Why do people eat cocktail when inflation is a problem? It's the solution. And it does one more thing. It brings down the Gini coefficient. It helps solve inequality. And uh, remember, you know, inflation takes away from creditors. It gives to debtors. When you look at the huge growing equality of that whole Great Depression, World War II era, right, and particularly went through the American high, right, and huge uh, decrease in inequality in America. Most of it really didn't occur much during the 1930s, interestingly enough. It started right around 1940, and particularly in World War II and the Korean War and after that. Why? Financial repression plus inflation. 
the treasury yield was stuck, right? The, the Fed and the, and the treasury conspired to keep it stuck at no higher than about 2.25, 2.5 maybe at the highest. Inflation was racing into the double digits. And we had price controls. We don't, we don't know really what inflation was actually doing. But creditors were getting killed, right, for 20 years. That was when inequality went down in America. That's when the middle class came back. And, and the, if you look at the Gini coefficient, it reached its all-time low in the late 70s. That was after stagflation, right? We killed creditors. We killed investors. And it was right around that, the late 70s, right, when we entered the new regime. And this is what I would just remind people of, that inflation, so, and by the way, I didn't, ask, I didn't add one more benefit of inflation, right? About a third of all creditors to treasury debt are foreigners. They're sovereign wealth. Right, so we push the cost banks. onto them. Yeah, exactly. America first. I mean, have you heard of that? I mean, <laughs> come on, this works. And, you know, they'll have no choice to come back to us later on, you know, for the new monetary system. Presumably, if America's still strong and still around, it's a little bit like, uh, like uh, you know, Argentina. They can always come back, you know, <laughs> and, and reestablish credit. But, but you, you understand my point. These are solutions. These are not bugs. These are features of, of inflation. And I do think that uh, just as in the, the you know, world, New Deal, World War II era, it started out as a very deflationary era, but it ended as an extraordinary inflationary one. And by the way, a hot economy. All Americans were suddenly getting these huge wage hikes, right? That was another element of the new equality, right? And people, you know, Americans were bidding up for jobs that it intended to increase the, uh, you know, labor capital, you know, ratio of, of national income. So all of this worked toward greater equality. Um, and I think we see the elements of that coming into place. I mean, back then it was new laws to sort of fortify and defend the role of unions. Uh, today, we see it with these new, uh, you know, higher minimum wage laws, which I have no doubt some form of them will go into effect, um, along with some form of this new, oh, I talk about social infrastructure, you know, uh, some of that. But I, I do think this is a new regime. And I think it's important for investors to, to, to understand that in that era from 1940 to, 19, you know, we all think about 1981 to today as being this period of, you know, uh, uh, decelerating inflation, declining interest rates, uh, less government, deregulation, greater inequality, and a cooler running economy. But in the previous 40 years, we went in the opposite direction on all those things, right? And that's- it, it Is it fair to say that you see us returning back, you know, like re reversing those trends of the past 1984. I mean, you see it in the tea leaves. I mean, you just see it, right? You see the gestation of it right now. And I, I do think that that's where we're moving. I, and I think some, if you look at it really broadly, Adam, you kind of think, yeah, that's probably not all that bad for the country in a sense. Uh, you know, it's, it's a very different world, uh, but it may not be bad in its overall impact, right? What kind of society we come out with on the other side. I mean, let's face it, you know, the 1950s and 1960s weren't the worst period, you know, of, uh, of American history. Uh, there's a lot to a lot happened that actually worked. Uh, and as I often point out, it did a lot to improve uh, the condition of minorities in America. You know, one, one point I often make is that, you know, African-Americans, uh, you know, earnings as a share of white earnings, home ownership as a share of uh, white ownership, rose faster in the late 40s, 50s, and early 60s than any other period in American history. This was a, um, a really great era for a lot of things that worked well. Uh, and we, we sometimes tend to look back on that era, you know, with, um, uh, you know, and, and with a critical eye. I think boomers particularly don't like it because, you know, they weren't allowed to express themselves. Well, they were rejecting <laughs> it, yeah, as they oh, Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, well, well Neil, I, I got to say um, that that's encouraging to hear. Um, you know, there are few people alive, I think, who are as knowledgeable about the conditions of previous generations as you. Uh, and to hear you say, hey, look, you know, it's going to be different and, and the path may not always be painless. 
But it sounds like you're saying, look, it's not necessarily, you know, we're not, we're not devolving into the dark ages here, likely. And I, I think yeah, it's important. Li likely. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think it's you important to, to, to reiterate exactly. this just because we have a lot of viewers who, uh, you know, I think can sometimes look at all the challenges that we currently face. They, they look at the debts and, and think of how unsustainable they are. They look at how high inflation may get at points in the future, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, and they, they project to a, oh, my gosh, the system is going to break down. And it's not just going to be sort of a cyclical turn. It's going to be like like a like a, a real permanent breakage into a, you know, I'm going to use an ex extreme adjective here, but like a dystopian future. And I think it's important to hear from experts like yourself. You're saying, ah, we're going to have some challenges for sure. And it may be different. But right now, on average, it's not looking like, you know, it's going to turn into the Lord of the Flies world. No, and, and I, I think that is important. You know, look, I, the Lord of the Flies world is, is, I mean, we have seen breaks in history where that has happened, but I, I absolutely don't think that's at all remotely the most likely scenario. I think you, you want to be aware of that, but I think most likely what's going to happen is going to be different, and you hope it's different in a, in a positive way. And I think it's very often the hardest thing for people to do is to broaden their approach, right? Get out of today's ideological, you know, narrow ideological frame and see it from a broader social and cultural point of view with a broader sense of history and say, you know, on balance, you can really see some positives coming out of here, right? And, and even positives about where we are today. Um, the seasons are an interesting way of looking at history. Uh, every season is necessary. Uh, it isn't not like, like there's some seasons that are just decline. No, some things are getting worse. Some things are getting better. It's the balance between them. Every season is necessary. And frankly, even the fourth turning, when a lot of old institutions are destroyed, that's necessary to rejuvenate us, right? To rejuvenate our institutions, to make them young again, so they're able to grow again, right? You need to do occasionally some creative destruction, not just in the private sector, right? But in our public life uh, and start over again and, and, and do something new, something, uh, something big. I think that's one thing that younger generations really miss, thinking big about our future again. Why can't we do that? Yeah, I think it's a great question. I do think, um, you know, sort of writ large, um, we are short of inspiration right now as a society. And uh, maybe perhaps having a little bit more of that, uh, you know, would be a welcome thing. Look, I hate to begin to bring the conversation uh, to a close here. Neil, there are so many questions I still want to ask you. I know I'm going to get a ton of additional ones when this video airs. So I hope we can have you back on the program again in the future. Sure. Um, but as we wrap up here, um, I believe that you are uh, one of the it's so many questions for you. And one of the top ones was, hey, what would Neil have written differently uh, in his book, The Fourth Turning, if you were writing it today? What well, sounds like you're working on maybe a, a, a new version of that? Yes, we're doing a, a book which is going to be appearing sometime, you know, very late in 2022. You know, I'm, I'm trying to finish the draft over the next few months. So I'm, you know, well, well into it, probably a little bit beyond halfway. Um, and uh, that will be out, you know, just, you know, that'll be, yeah, that'll be a pretty visible book. I mean, I know our, our publishers, it's, it's Simon and & Schuster and, you know, it'll be out everywhere. And I will let everyone know, obviously, my, my Twitter handle is um, uh, Howitt Generation. So, you know, people can follow me there. They can follow the work I do on Hedgeye uh, there. And uh, they can keep up with, you know, when the book is coming out. I, there's obviously a lot to update. And, and you know, no, history is prescripted only in its most general way, right? And so a lot that happens, which is individual and problematic and makes you think about contingency and choice and right. I mean, how, you know, uh, nothing is predetermined, uh, nothing is written. <laughs> we always have choices. And I do think it's very interesting, this, this, this fourth turning that we're in, um, I think is definitely recognizable as a fourth turning. I mean, the, the polarization, the division of America into these two halves, the, the complete you know, loss of functionality of central institutions. 
uh, is just sort of obvious in the experimentation with radical alternatives all of a sudden. Um, it, it's interesting that um, I think maybe the one difference, and I'll be talking a little bit about this, is the the slowing down of the life cycle a little bit. You know, uh, uh, young people are a little bit older now when they actually become adults. Now they take all their courses in adulting, <laughs> and then they become adults a little <laughs> later. Uh, Gen Xers are now very late in coming to real positions of midlife power. They're still almost invisible in politics, amazingly enough. You know, the oldest Gen Xers are already, uh, you know, hit, you know, at least by my reckoning, are, are hitting age 60. Uh, where, we, you know, we had one 1960 born president, uh, I should say 1961 born president, Barack Obama, but we haven't really seen much from that generation uh, at all. Uh, they seem even in congressional politics, they're not terribly visible. They're not even in the presidential primaries. So they have been slow, even in the corporate C-suite, Gen X has been slow. Uh, uh, boomers still dominate, right? Uh, and uh, the silent generation is still out there. So the slowing down of the life cycle, I do think has slowed the cycle down a little bit. You can see that palpably, which is part of the reason why we see this, this, this fourth turning extending a little bit because you know generations are sort of slower, the life cycle, each phase of life is kind of broadening a little bit, right? And I think that's an interesting adjustment. We'll be talking about that, talking a lot more about specifically what happens during a fourth turning. I think that's the biggest thing that the readers are curious about, right? How do we understand today's events in light of earlier crises? Look very closely at actually what happened in those crises. That's something we really didn't do that much in our earlier books. And I think that's a huge new element. And what can we expect in the 2030s when ultimately we move on into the next first turning, right? Will that be the new golden age, right? After the crisis, you know, typically you get suddenly this sense of rebirth, you know, this new era of peace and prosperity and planning and, and security. And when everyone feels great about the world in the future again, what will that look like? It'll be a millennial run world, Adam. I don't know whether you're, you're ready for that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> having, having some children that are kind of bumping up against the millennial, the more and the, the older Gen Z. Uh, I, I've, I've got some, uh, you know, makes me feel good in some ways, make me feel worried in some other ways, but we'll see. Well, they'll, they'll be the coming of age, right? They'll be the young adults in that era. So you, you kind of think about, you think differently even about your own kids, your own parents this way, so. Well, Neil, I, I know we're going to have a ton of people that are going to be super interested in that book when it comes out. Uh, I'd love to have you on beforehand to dig more deeply into what we've talked about. But obviously, when the book comes out next year, uh, we'll have you come on so you can let everybody know how to get it then. Um, all right. Well, look, uh, Neil, thank you so much for your time. Everybody else, thanks so much for watching. Uh, if you'd like to support this channel and see more great speakers like Neil, please, as always, just hit the like button and then click the subscribe button below, as well as the little bell icon right next to it. Two simple steps, but one that really does help this video get out to more viewers. Neil, love to have you back on again soon. So many more questions to get through, but thank you so much for all the insights that you've shared in this amazing discussion today. Great. Thank you, Adam.